All right, good morning. And uh, for those who don't know, I'm Pastor Aaron. I'm the associate pastor here. And so, uh, sorry, um, but glad that you're here this, this Sunday morning. And I, uh, I'm happy for the opportunity to be able to preach the, the word of the Lord to you. And, um, well, let's just start by praying. Kind Father, uh, as we open up your word, we ask that you would speak to us. That you would speak to us uh, by your spirit. That you would convict of sin, that you would encourage uh, by the Spirit, that you would make your people uh, more like your Son, and that you would receive the glory and the honor and praise we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you follow the news, you may have heard the story of, of Carson King. Now, you might not remember his name, but you, probably, you may remember his story. It was a little while ago where uh, he got this coveted position uh, to be able to stand behind the announcers at ESPN College Game Day, you know, uh, as they're getting ready for uh, some college football. And he, well, he had a sign. He took advantage of the opportunity with a sign that said, ran out of beer money, then me. And then he gave his Venmo, which is basically a, a way to electronically transfer some cash to him. He's largely looking for a gag, uh, or perhaps maybe 20 bucks to buy a case of his favorite beer, Anheuser-Busch. Um, but what he realized, that after an hour, he received about $400. And as the money continued to tick up, up, he realized, well, I should really give this away. And so he decided that he was going to donate all but, you know, about the $20 to a, the children's hospital. And news of that began to spread. And people began giving more and more and more money. And eventually, Anheuser-Busch and Venmo decided they were going to match it. And overall, he ended up raising over a million dollars for this children's hospital. People were pretty excited. And he was looking like this, this great hero who was donating all, all this money. Uh, but then a newspaper reporter wanted to do a, a little story on him. And they found that this young man doing this deed, well, he had a troubled history, if you will. About eight years prior, when he was 16, he said some really nasty and racist things on his uh, Twitter account. And then the story of this young man completely changed. Where he was this hero, he became a villain. Anheuser-Busch, who was looking to maybe put him on the face of their, of their beer um, and give him a, a year's supply for free. We're like, nope, they're washing their hands of him. Now, when you Google his name, what you come up with is not just the story of his heroism, but the story of his lowest moment. Now, in this modern age and modern day, we see all too clearly that words have lasting power, that they can change the course of our history for good or for bad. It doesn't take long to look at the stories that, that fill our newsfeed of different accounts, whether it's Kyle Cashew, the Parkland uh, school shooting survivor who was accepted into Harvard, but then a private conversation where he said some pretty nasty things got leaked and had his offer rescinded. Or Clara Janover, which happened just a few weeks ago, who uh, hyperbolically suggested about wanting to stab people who say all lives matter, and found herself fired from Deloitte. Now, whether you think that they're justified or unjustified, or whether you think that they're blown out of proportion, or whether it just makes you a little bit queasy to, to see the unforgiving, merciless mob destroy people's lives for things that they said eight, nine, ten, or more years ago, or whether you think it's entirely appropriate, what we all can agree with are words have consequences. And you parents of children of, uh, let's say, social media age, I'm sure you've had talks about the things that are, well, appropriate to say in such a medium. That the things that we say that we think, oh, we're surrounded just by our friends who are going to, to read the things in the light, like our friendship, who know my heart and know who I am behind it, that aren't going to read too much or too little into it. Well, we realize that these words are immortal, and they can come back by people who are far less gracious than the people surrounding us. That these words have a life of their own that we can't squelch out, and we can be ruined by an inappropriate joke, an unsophisticated 
uh, way of diving into a, a, a hard topic. Or sometimes even the changing cultural tides that, that make what was fine and normal seem aberrant and wrong. That the things that we, that we speak can change our lives, and oftentimes for the worse. And so you parents probably have the talk with your, your kids about what's appropriate to say and what's not. Um, but despite all this, despite us having this immortal, uh, lasting language that's out there in the ether, and despite us seeing regularly the consequences of uh, ill-thought-out speech, perhaps we still undervalue the role of speech in our lives. Now, if you would, turn in your Bibles to James chapter 3. If you have one of the, the pew Bibles, if you, or you didn't bring your own Bible, and you grab one from any of the doors, it's going to be on page 976. Uh, and we're going to be reading uh, a sizable portion of the first 12 verses of James chapter 3. Now, if you remember from last week, uh, Pastor Sean was talking about, well, the nature of, of faith and works, how they work together. Um, and that true faith, abiding faith in Christ, is going to produce works in the person's life. That it's not just going to be, oh, well, I have this mental ascent, or I believe, or I can affirm the teachings and the doctrines of the church. But no, there's, there's something much deeper that, that as you have true faith in Jesus, well, your life is changed. It's shown by how you, how you work. Now, James is, well, he can be kind of seemingly erratic sometimes when we read him. He, he changes topic pretty quickly sometimes. It's, it's part of the, the nature of his wisdom literature motif. Um, but he, he has this tendency throughout his, his book to change between talking about good works and speech quite often. And here we're going to find a clue as to why. So James chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make mistakes, for if we could control our tongue, we would be perfect, and we could also control, ev control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a small rudder, rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set the whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. So as we dive into James, he has quite a few things to say about the tongue, and which he's using as a shorthand for basically our speech. Largely to others in open, but sometimes perhaps even in, in private as we speak to ourselves words. And he has a really high view of the tongue, right? That, and he's calling people, calling Christians to, well, guard the tongue, to tame the tongue, if you will, because it's unique in its directing power, first off. He shows what the tongue at its best can do, and it can change the course of one's life, right? So <clears throat> to control the tongue, he says, is to be perfect, and it seems so foreign, I mean, because there's so many other sins, so many sins that seem so much greater and worse or more severe than simply the things that come out of my mouth. Yet for James, he says, if you control the tongue, well, yet you're going to be perfect. It's like you know, 
one commentator, uh, James Motyer, he, he talks about it like a, a switchboard on, in, you know, for, well, a sound system. Right, so Patrick's up there, and he has a switch for you know, every single mic. He can turn somebody up, somebody down. He can turn you know, the guitar up or the guitar down or the piano or my voice up and down. He can do all those things, but he also has a master switch. that He clicks it or pulls it down, and it happens to all the mics. They all t- come down or turn on. Right? And James is saying the tongue is the master switch. You control it, you bring it down, and you can become a perfect person. And it seems, it seems so well unfathomable to, to us. It seems so unlikely. And so he gives us a few examples of small things having a big impact, right? The horse, something that's way heavier than a person, way stronger than a person, and yet while a person may not be able to control it directly with their will or power or might, they can control this horse and show where it will go by a small little bit placed in its mouth. And then he gives an example of, of a ship that can be moved by just a small little rudder. Now, just a, f- a few miles north of here in Norfolk, uh, there oftentimes is placed the, the USS Eisenhower. It's this massive aircraft carrier. Um, it is like uh, 24 stories high. And the, the field deck, or the flight deck, is four and a half acres big. It's humongous. It can fit, I think, around 60, 60 planes, and it weighs 95,000 tons. And yet the whole thing is guided by comparatively small, two, two little rudders, 20 feet by 29 feet, right? This thing that dwarfs this entire building, yet is able to be controlled and maneuvered by just something that's, well, probably about the size of those curtains, maybe a little bit bigger. And for James, he's saying this is like our tongue. It is unique in its directing power, that you are where you are and where you want to be, which is perfect, I think he's assuming, that is going to be controlled by your tongue. It is going to be the rudders that guide you from where you are to where you want to be, where God has called you to be. And it can happen through the tongue. The tongue at its best is unique beyond all else in its ability to get you from one place to another. So he's saying you, we, need to hold under control because it's This is what's going to get you past the winds and waves of life that will seek to derail you. This is what's going to get you through times that are dark. It's not, you know, he's talking about the ship that even though that there's winds that are trying to control it and move it where it wants to go, the rudder ends up having the final say. The rudder guided by the pilot. And the tongue is like that. Guided by your mind the tongue is going to determine how you navigate the stormy seas. It is unique in its directing power. But that's the good news. And then there's the bad news. He hinted at it at the beginning. Well, it's we all make many mistakes, don't we? And then he goes a little bit deeper and darker, and he begins to talk about how the the tongue is unique, not only in its directing power, but in its destructive power. And he likens it to a fire, right? But a tiny spark can get set a great uh, forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. That the untamed tongue can torch and destroy your life. To steal a phrase from, uh, and twist it, from the late Dallas Willard, the tongue makes an excellent servant, but a terrible master. That at its best, the tongue is the thing that's going to navigate you through the hardest times of life, but at its worst, it's going to destroy the whole course of your life. Set on fire by hell itself, he says, that it, you know, the it, there's a whole world, a whole 
ecosystem of unrighteousness that we hold within our mouths. This little thing that can be so powerful and so beneficial, yet at the end of the day, what we find is that it's so destructive to our souls. Now, if you're like me, I kind of grew up in a church context, and this is what I gleaned growing up. This is the way I thought about speech, or really bad speech, sins of speech. Now, no one taught me this, and I'm sure if I, if I suggested this, that they would say, oh, no, that's a very incomplete view. But this is what I've pretty much gathered picking up just from, well, being in church, that, that sins of speech kind of fall into two categories. There are the words that you just don't say, the no-no words. They're generally around four letters, give or take one. Um, and those are, you just don't say them, right? If you're a good Christian, avoid those, and everything's going fine. And then there's activities, right? So, you know, the things that we, that we do like, you know, gossip or lie or slander somebody, avoid those activities, avoid the no-no words, and, you know, that's pretty much it. Now, I read, a, I read an article the, uh, a while back, and it's been one of those ones that, that stuck with me for a long time by an author named uh, Remy Wilkins. He's a, he's a teacher down south um, and a, a novelist for, I think, middle school schoolers or something like that. Um, but it was this really, well, he had a really interesting way of looking at, at words. And rather than just it being about, you know, the no-no words or the activities, uh, he's really looking at them in their function. And so we're going to talk about a little bit about, well, four ways where we can err in our speech. And he's going to use these in a ways that are uh, probably more technical than the ways that we use them in everyday language. Now, these four ways, we may use them interchangeably in the day-to-day -day discourse, but he's, he's drawing them out to distinguish them about four different ways, four different functions of how well we can miss the mark. And if you can't read them, I am sorry, um, but, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, so, the first way... are things that are vulgar. Now, again, oftentimes we will use some of these interchangeably, but when vulgar, it comes from, you know, the Latin to mean common. Like if you've heard of the, the Latin Vulgate, it is the, the scriptures translated into the common tongue of the empire, Latin, right? And there's nothing wrong with things being common. There's nothing wrong with things being normal. Right? The problem is what we would call vulgar is when things that are common are exalted to be something that's uncommon, to be something that's holy. When we take something that is, is low and common, and rather than treating it as it is, we treat it as something that's, well, holy, we are missing the mark. We are using vulgar speech. So... <clears throat> Coming back to James, if you flip back in your Bible to, to James chapter, chapter 1, he gives, a, well, he gives some instruction on how to avoid vulgar speak, though he doesn't use the word. What he says is in uh, verse 10 and 11, he says, Those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers and the little flower droops and falls. Its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away in, with all their achievements. Right? So what is he saying? He's saying for people to, to boast in things like our achievements, our wealth, our status, perhaps we can add our beauty, our popularity, our successes. We boast in these things as vulgar speak because it is elevating these things that are common, that are transient and ephemeral, and exalting them up as if they had some real lasting significance. So rather than boasting in your riches and your wealth, you boast in your humiliation. You boast in the fact that these mean nothing before a holy God. To avoid vulgar speak is to not ele elevate these things about us that are inconsequential as if they were somehow super significant. 
but to see them for what they are, things that are gone in a moment, like the flowers of the field. And so we engage in vulgar speak when we take things that are common and exalt them. Our political candidates and causes, our health, whether for good or for bad, Sometimes even the exaltation of science, making it more than just a tool, but making it the means of the good life. These things are vulgar. Next, so vulgar is taking something that's low, something that's common, and exalting it up as it's holy. The other way is the opposite. It is profane. And what do you profane? You profane things that are holy. Things that are high and exalted that God has set apart for himself. And you bring them down to as if they were common. As if they were normal. That you don't distinguish them from the rest of everyday life. So before the verse that we read in James chapter 1, in verse 9, this is what he he, uh, writes. He warns against profane speech. He says, you know, believers that are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. Right? That to avoid profane speech is to see things in this, well, as God sees them. That you who are poor, you who are the underclass, you who, well, are going through trials and tribulations, rather than whining and complaining about your lot in life, that you are rejoicing and boasting in about what God has done. That God has deemed you, the poor, the humble, the lowly, as worthy to be his heir alongside Jesus. That he has given you this promise that you are going to participate in the judging of angels of ruling the world, that the meek will inherit the earth. That for the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And to to sit there and, and whine and complain and to grumble is to say, well, is to reject the holy calling and the holy nature of what God has done for you in Christ. It's to take something that is holy and make it common. So I, I once uh, participated, well, with, in, a, in a communion service, to illustrate this, of, you know, this, this what I would call a, a holy event. You know, it's the church coming and, and I would say, spiritually being united to Christ and one another through remembering and participating in his life and death. And rather than treating it as it was in its holiness, it was treated as a, as a game and as a joke. That every line leading up to the, the participation in Christ, the breaking of the body, the drinking of the blood, that it was zingers and jokes and taking this holy thing and making it as if it were a common thing. That is more profane than any four-letter word that we can think of. And so James, he calls us as people to speak rightly, to avoid both vulgarity and profanity, um, and basically in in how we view the holy. To view, well, those made in the image of God as deemed as having some respect owed to them, right? How it couldn't be that the same mouth that praises God will curse those made in his image. It can't be. It can't be those that, that have been bought and purchased by the blood of Jesus are going to, to cry and, and rail against their lot in life. Now that is profane, It is taking the holy and making it common. And God has called us to, well, to right speech. Next, so vulgarity is taking things that are low and bringing them high. And profanity is taking things that are high, holy, and bringing them low. And, well, the the cross axis are going to be somewhat similar as well. We have 
things that are obscene, which just basically means to put filth in front. Right? It's, it's taking things that are filthy and putting them in front in the public in order to be praised or normalized. We take things that are, well, not fit for consumption, but we put them out there in order for us to, to enjoy them, to praise them, or just to make it seem like it was common and normal. Of course, the most obvious example is pornography of oftentimes vile acts, but put out there for, for public consumption. It is, well, at its base, obscene. Now, in the church, oftentimes we can get, well, we can get so excited about not being PC, politically correct, that we give rise to obscene talk. Because we're so against wanting to, to fall into a PC culture that we give credence or normalization or even praise to things that are oftentimes well, disgusting or racist or just not okay. It is an attack at us. And lastly, whereas obscene is to take things that are, are evil and to put them in the public eye in order to, to praise or normalize them, the opposite is also true. What we would, what, uh, Remy Wilkins would call crude, which is to put things that are good into the public eye to mock them. Right? To mock the, the pious as just naive rubes. To mock the sanctity of the marriage bed as something less than glorious. To shame the meek as just being weak. To shame those who are slow to anger as being, well, walk, people who are walked on rather than strong. That these are the ways that, that we engage in crudeness, that the good, the good things, things that are, are right and pure and good, that we, that we lift them up and put them in front of people in order to mock and shame them. Right? So we have this, well, what Remy Wilkins called the, the cross of strong language. You know, to you know, take things that are low, put them high, take things that are high, put them low, take things that are evil and to put them in front in order to, to praise them, and to take things that are good, to put them in front in order to mock them. And all these things that we should avoid point us also to a, a counteracting truth that we should engage in. That we are not made perfect by simply not speaking at all, but we are made perfect by doing the opposite of these things. To elevate that which is holy for praise. To treat things that are common as such. To bring things that are ugly and evil and despicable into the public, not to praise them, but to show them for what they are. And to bring things that are pure and holy and right into the public in order to praise them. Now this is, this is what true speech does. This is the speech that will get you from where you are to being the perfect person that you have been called to be. This is the, the kind of speech that's going to transform a culture. And without people who are engaging not just in not doing these things, but in doing as they should, without that, what ends up happening is that there is a, a vacuum within a society and bad speech overcomes it all. Remember, it is a world of unrighteousness. Set on fire by hell itself, says James. And without those who are in society praising the good, condemning the evil, lifting up the holy, and condemning the profane, well, what we're going to find is society, our house, our lives are filled with evil speech. So, <clears throat> we've had the good news that we have this incredible power of the tongue, that it is unique in its directing power, and the bad news that it's also unique in its destructive power, and we have also the, the worst news 
that it is unique in its depraved nature. That it is untamable. Going back to James, starting at uh, 3, verse 7, what we hear him say is, you know, people, we, you know, we can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Right? That, that our tongue, unlike animals that we can train to subdue, that we can tr- train to at least respect us, even things as dumb as reptiles, that we can sometimes bond in a relationship with them. Yet the tongue, well, it's restless in its evil, that we cannot tame it. We cannot keep it in, uh, checked on. It is unique in all of nature for that reason. And is unique also in this, re- in this reason. Uh, James goes on to, to make this contrast between uh, what's, hap- what's true in nature and what's true of our tongue. Normally, things are going to completely reflect the source from which they come. It's, you know, a good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit, and as James is talking, a fig tree produces fig fruit and not grapes. Uh, uh, fresh water doesn't come out of, you know, a salty s- spring, right? Those things are, are common and normal. That's Right, but in the human heart, there's something different. <clears throat> the same tongue that can praise God can curse those made in his image. Right? That as hard as we try, we can't get beyond, well, ultimately falling at some level within this cross of, of we say, wicked language. And why is that? Why, can we, why are we untamable? Well, it's because that our speech is so connected to our hearts. Right? The scriptures talk about how well, out of the heart the mouth speaks. But what is the heart? Well, it's deceitful and wicked beyond all else. Who can know it? Right? That our hearts lie to us. Our hearts take pleasure in things that are evil and call them good. Our hearts take well disgust in things that are pure and good and call them wicked. Our hearts laugh at the things that are holy, and our hearts exalt the things that are profane. That our hearts, in many ways, well, they they are what Calvin would call an idle factory, constantly putting before us things that are not God, and calling them our ultimate source of salvation, and goodness, and glory. And so our, our speech will always reflect that. We can't get beyond that. We can't, speak, we, we can't speak with the love that God has for what is true, good, and holy until we have God's heart for what is true, good, and holy. Nor can we, re, can we speak with all sincerity of the things that are wicked and vile and, and terrible until we view these things in the same way that God does. That for us to change our heart, for us to, to pull the, the slide on the, the master switch of our soul, well, we need a new heart. That no man can tame his heart. But there is one who can. There is one of whom it was written that all he did and all he said was what he saw his father doing. Who loved the good as God loved and hated the evil as God hated the evil. It was the one for whom you have been called in uh, 1 Peter 2 because Christ has suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile them. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. That in seeing the vision, seeing the the image of Christ, the one whose life and language was perfect, seeing him lifted up on the cross on our behalf, seeing his image, well, it makes us call the, the same utterance of Isaiah 
Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips who dwells among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the glory, the Holy One of Israel. And so my calling for us as a people is to give God access to our hearts, that our our lives, our language would be filled with praises for what is good and true and holy, that we would avoid error on either way, not that we would be silent, to take James's metaphor that just because the pilot of a ship may go into the rocks, he's not better to cut off the rudder altogether, or because the, the spring sometimes bring salty water, it's not better to be dry. What we need as a people is to be transformed. And this is what God desires to do among us, his people. This is what God is doing among us, his people. As I was visiting uh, the, uh, at Barbara's visitation of the family, uh, one of the, the lines just jumped out at me, said by one of her sons, um, you know, he, he talked about how Barbara was well, his, his best friend. Uh, he would talk to her at least five days a week about everything, and she would talk to him. Well, the thing that lasted with him was that, you know, she never said anything bad about anybody. And she worked with me for several years. But as we, as God's people, as we give access to God's spirit, and his power, that we will be able to realize and actualize the tongue at its best. That's unique in its oh, directing power, to avoid it at its worst in its destructive power, and to give away the, the keys to our heart and our tongue as God overcomes its depraved nature. So let's pray. Kind Father. In many ways, um, well, I know I, I, have, I have fallen short with the use of my tongue. I have exalted things as holy that are common, and I've brought down what is holy to be common. I have praised evil. I have mocked good. And in my heart, Lord, I know that I need your hand and your touch and your guidance. So come, Lord, in, in my life and in the life of your, this, your people, that you would transform our, our hearts even now, that you would purify our tongue, that as you did with Isaiah, that you, you took, the, took the, the, the coal with tongs, your, your seraphim took the coal with tongs and, and placed it on his lips to give purity to his mouth. Lord, we ask today that for us you would do the same that our lips would be filled with your praises and that you would glorify yourself among us, your people, we pray in the wonderful and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.